The Story of Civilization, Volume 2, The Life of Greece, Part 1, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 2, Side 1. The highest art of Mycenae was in metals. Here the mainland equaled Crete and dared to use its own forms and decoration. If Schliemann did not quite find the bones of Agamemnon, he found their weight in silver and gold. Jewelry of many kinds, in spendthrift quantities, stud buttons worthy of any king, intaglios live with scenes of hunting, war, or piracy, and a cow's head in shining silver, with horns and frontal rosette of gold. At any moment one expects from it the plaintive mooing to which Schliemann, never at a loss for explanations, traced the name Mycenae, Mukenai. The finest of these metal relics from Tyrans and Mycenae are two bronze daggers inlaid with electron and burnished gold, and elegantly engraved with wildcats chasing ducks and lions pursuing leopards or fighting men. Most peculiar of all the remains are the golden masks apparently laid over the faces of dead royalty. One mask looks for all the world like the face of a cat. However, the gallant Schliemann ascribed it not to Clytemnestra, but to Agamemnon. The unquestioned masterpieces of Mycenaean art were found neither at Tyrans nor at Mycenae, but in a tomb at Vaphio, near Sparta, where a minor prince once emulated the magnificence of the northern kings. Here, amid another treasure of jewelry, were two thin cups of beaten gold, simply formed and yet worked with the loving patience of all great art. The craftsmanship is so like the best Minoan that most students are inclined to attribute these cups to some Cretan Cellini, but it would be a pity to deprive the Mycenaean culture of its most perfect memorials. The subject, the snaring and taming of a bull, seems characteristically Cretan, and yet the frequency with which such scenes are engraved upon Mycenaean rings and seals or painted upon the palace walls shows that the bull sport was as popular on the mainland as on the island. On one of the cups the bull is caught in a net of heavy rope, his mouth and nostrils gape with breathless anger and fatigue as he struggles to get free and imprisons himself the more. While on the other side a second bull gallops off in terror, and a third charges at a cowboy who catches it bravely by the horns. On the companion cup the captured bull is being led away. As we turn the vessel around, we see him already reconciled to the restraints of civilization and engaged, as Evans puts it, in amorous conversation with a cow. Many centuries were to pass before such skillful work would appear again in Greece. The Mycenaean himself, as well as most of his art, is found in the tombs. For he folded and buried his dead in comfortable jars, and seldom cremated them as the heroic age would do. Apparently he believed in a future life, for many objects of use and value were placed in the graves. For the rest, Mycenaean religion, so far as it reveals itself to us, gives every evidence of Cretan origin or kinship. Here, as in Crete, are the double axe, the sacred pillar, the holy dove, and the cult of a mother goddess associated with a young male deity, presumably her son. And here again are attendant divinities in the form of snakes. Through all the transformations of religion known to us in Greece, the mother goddess has remained. After the Cretan Rhea came Demeter, the Mater Dolorosa of the Greeks, after Demeter, the virgin mother of God. Today, standing on the ruins of Mycenae, one sees in the little village below a modest Christian church. Grandeur is gone, simplicity and consolation remain. Civilizations come and go, they conquer the earth and crumble into dust, but faith survives every desolation. After the fall of Knossos, Mycenae prospered as never before. The rising wealth of the Shaft Grave dynasty raised great palaces upon the hills of Mycenae and Tyrans. Mycenaean art took on a character of its own and captured the markets of the Aegean. Now the commerce of the mainland princes reached eastward into Cyprus and Syria, southward through the Cyclades to Egypt, westward through Italy to Spain, northward through Boeotia and Thessaly to the Danube, and found itself balked only at Troy. Like Rome absorbing and disseminating the civilization of Hellas, so Mycenae, won by the culture of dying Crete, spread the Mycenaean phase of that culture throughout the Mediterranean world. 4. Troy Between the Greek mainland and Crete, 220 islands dot the Aegean, forming a circle around Delos, and therefore called the Cyclades. Most of them are rugged and barren, precarious mountain survivals of a land half drowned in the sea. But some were rich enough in marble or metal to be already busy and civilized, as the world goes, long before Greek history comes into our view. In 1896, the British School of Athens dug into the soil of Milos at Philocopi and found tools, weapons, and pottery remarkably akin, age by age, to the Minoan. 
and a like research in other islands, has built up a prehistoric picture of the Cyclades conforming in time and character, though never comparable in artistic excellence, with the bioscope of Crete. The Cyclades were cramped for land, totaling less than a thousand square miles among them, and proved, like classic Greece, incapable of uniting under one political power. By the 17th century B.C., the Little Isles had passed in government and art, even here and there in language and writing, under Cretan domination. Then in the final period, 1400 to 1200, the imports from Crete fell away, and the islands increasingly took their pottery and their styles from Mycenae. Moving eastward into the Sporides, or scattered, islands, we find in Rhodes another prehistoric culture of the simpler Aegean type. In Cyprus, the rich deposits of copper that gave the island its name brought it a measure of wealth throughout the Bronze Age, 3400 to 1200, but its wares remained crude and undistinguished before the coming of Cretan influence. Its population, predominantly Asiatic, used a syllabic script akin to the Minoan and worshipped a goddess apparently descended from the Semitic Ishtar and destined to become the Aphrodite of the Greeks. After 1600, the metal industry of the island developed rapidly. The mines, owned by the royal government, exported copper to Egypt, Crete, and Greece. The foundry at Encomi made famous daggers, and the potters sold their globular bowls from Egypt to Troy. The forests were cut into timber, and Cyprus, from Cyprus, began to compete with the cedars of Lebanon. In the 13th century, Mycenaean colonists founded the colonies that were to become the Greek cities of Paphos, sacred to Aphrodite, and Kittium, birthplace of the Stoic Zeno, and Cyprian Salamis, where Solon paused in his wanderings to replace chaos with law. From Cyprus, Mycenaean trade and influence crossed to Syria and Caria, and thence, as well as by other rowing stones, they moved up the coasts and islands of Asia until they reached Troy. There, on a hill separated by three miles from the sea, Schliemann and Dirkfeldt found nine cities superimposed each upon its predecessor, as if Troy had had nine lives. 1. In the lowest strata were the remains of a Neolithic village coming down to 3000 B.C. Here were walls of rough stones mortared with mud, clay whorls, bits of worked ivory, tools of obsidian, and pieces of hand-polished black pottery. 2. Above this lay the ruins of the second city, which Schliemann believed to have been Homer's Troy. Its enclosing walls, like those of Tyrans and Mycenae, were of Cyclopean stones. At intervals there were fortresses, and at the corners great double gates, of which two are well preserved. Some houses survived to a height of four feet, their walls built of brick and wood upon a stone foundation. The red-painted pottery, wheel-turned but crude, indicates a lifespan for this city from approximately 2400 to 1900. Bronze has replaced stone for tools and weapons, and jewelry abounds, but the statuettes are unprepossessingly primitive. The second city was apparently destroyed by fire. Signs of conflagration are numerous, and persuaded Schliemann that this was the work of Agamemnon's Greeks. 3 to 5. Above the burnt city are the relics of three successive hamlets, small and poor, and negligible in archaeological content. 6. About 1600 another city rose on the historic hill. Through the passionate haste of his work, Schliemann mixed the objects of this stratum with those of the second, and dismissed the sixth city as an unimportant Lydian settlement. But Derpfeldt, continuing the excavations after Schliemann's death, and for a time with Schliemann's money, revealed a town considerably larger than the second, ornate with substantial buildings in dressed stone, and enclosed by a thirty-foot wall, of whose four gates three remain. In the ruins were monochrome vases of finer workmanship than before, vessels like the Minian ware of Orchamenos, and potsherds so like those found at Mycenae that Derpfeldt considered them to be importations from that city, and therefore contemporary with the Shaftgrave dynasty, 1400 to 1200. On these and other shifting grounds, current opinion identifies the sixth city with Homer's Troy, and assigns to it the treasury of Priam that Schliemann thought he had found in the second city. Six bracelets, two goblets, two diadems, a fillet, sixty earrings, and eighty-seven hundred other pieces, all in gold. The sixth city, too, we are assured, perished by fire shortly after 1200. Greek historians traditionally assigned the siege of Troy to 1194 to 1184 B.C. Who were the Trojans? 
An Egyptian papyrus mentions certain Dardanui as among the allies of the Hittites at the Battle of Kadesh in 1287. It is likely that these were the ancestors of the Dardanoi, who in Homer's terminology are one with the Trojans. Probably these Dardani were of Balkan origin, crossed the Hellespont in the 16th century with the kindred Phrygians, and settled in the lower valley of the Scamander. Herodotus, however, identified the Trojans with the Teucrians, and the Teucrians, according to Strabo, were Cretans who settled in the Troad, perhaps after the fall of Knossos. Both Crete and the Troad had a sacred Mount Ida, the many-fountained Ida of Homer and Tennyson. Presumably the region was subject at various times to political and ethnic influences from the Hittite hinterland. All in all, the excavations indicate a civilization partly Minoan, partly Mycenaean, partly Asiatic, partly Danubian. Homer represents the Trojans as speaking the same language and worshipping the same gods as the Greeks, but later Hellenic imagination preferred to think of Troy as an Asiatic city and of the famous siege as the first known episode in an endless contest between Semite and Aryan, east and west. More significant than the racial complexion of its people was the strategic position of Troy near the entrance to the Hellespont and the rich lands about the Black Sea. Throughout history that narrow passage has been the battleground of empires. The siege of Troy was the Gallipoli adventure of 1194 B.C. The plain was moderately fertile, and precious metals lay in the soil to the east, but this alone would hardly account for the wealth of Troy and the tenacious attack of the Greeks. The city was admirably placed to levy tolls upon vessels wishing to pass through the Hellespont, while it was too far inland to be conveniently assailed from the sea. Perhaps it was this, and not Helen's face, that launched a thousand ships upon Ilium. On a likelier theory, the southward current and winds in the strait persuaded merchants to unload their cargoes at Troy and ship them overland into the interior. From the charges exacted for this service, Troy may have derived its wealth and power. In any case, the city's trade grew rapidly, as may be judged from the varied provenance of its remains. From the lower Aegean came copper, olive oil, wine, and pottery. From the Danube and Thrace came pottery, amber, horses, and swords. From distant China came so great a rarity as jade. In return, Troy brought from the interior and exported timber, silver, gold, and wild asses. Seated proudly behind their walls, the horse-taming Trojans dominated the Troad and taxed its trade on land and sea. The picture that we derive from the Iliad of Priam and his household is one of biblical grandeur and patriarchal benevolence. The king is polygamous, not as a diversion, but as a royal responsibility to continue his high breed abundantly. His sons are monogamous, and as well behaved as the fictitious Victorians, excepting, of course, the gay Paris, who is as innocent of morals as Alcibiades. Hector, Helenus, and Troilus are more likable than the vacillating Agamemnon, the treacherous Odysseus, and the petulant Achilles. Andromache and Polyxena are as charming as Helen and Iphigenia, and Hecuba is a shade better than Clytemnestra. All in all, the Trojans, as pictured by their enemies, seem to us less deceitful, more devoted, better gentlemen than the Greeks who conquered them. The conquerors themselves felt this in later days. Homer had many a kind word to say for the Trojans, and Sappho and Euripides left no doubt as to where their sympathies and admiration lay. It was a pity that these noble Dardans stood in the way of an expanding Greece, which, despite its multitude of faults, would in the end bring to this and every other region of the Mediterranean a higher civilization than they had ever known. Chapter 3 The Heroic Age 1. The Achaeans Modest Hittite tablets from Bogaz Kui of approximately 1325 B.C. speak of the Ahiava as a people equal in power to the Hittites themselves. An Egyptian record towards 1221 B.C. mentions the Akaiwasha as joining other peoples of the sea in a Libyan invasion of Egypt and describes them as a roving band fighting to fill their bellies. In Homer, the Achaeans are specifically a Greek-speaking people of southern Thessaly. Often, however, because they had become the most powerful of the Greek tribes, Homer uses their name for all the Greeks at Troy. Greek historians and poets of the Classic Age called the Achaeans, like the Pelasgians, Autochthonous, native to Greece as far back as memory could recall. And they assumed without hesitation that the Achaean culture described in Homer was one with that which has here been termed Mycenaean. 
Schliemann accepted this identification, and for a brief while the world of scholarship agreed with him. In 1901, an unusually iconoclastic Englishman, Sir William Ridgway, upset this happy confidence by pointing out that though Achaean civilization agreed with the Mycenaean in many ways, it differed in vital particulars. One, iron is practically unknown to the Mycenaeans, the Achaeans are familiar with it. Two, the dead in Homer are cremated, in Tyrans and Mycenae they are buried, implying a different conception of the afterlife. Three, the Achaean gods are the Olympians, of whom no trace has been found in the culture of Mycenae. Four, the Achaeans used long swords, round shields, and safety pin brooches. No objects of such form appear in the varied Mycenaean remains. Five, there are considerable dissimilarities in coiffure and dress. Ridgway concluded that the Mycenaeans were Pelasgians and spoke Greek, that the Achaeans were blonde Celts, or Central Europeans, who came down through Epirus and Thessaly from 2000 onward, brought with them the worship of Zeus, invaded the Peloponnesus about 1400, adopted Greek speech and many Greek ways, and established themselves as feudal chieftains, ruling from their fortress palaces a subjugated Pelasgian population. The theory is illuminating, even if it must be substantially modified. Greek literature says nothing of an Achaean invasion, and it would not be wise to hang a rejection of so unanimous a tradition upon a gradual increase in the use of iron, a change in modes of burial or coiffure, a lengthening of swords or rounding of shields, or even a safety pin. It is more likely that the Achaeans, as all classic writers supposed, were a Greek tribe that, in its natural multiplication, expanded from Thessaly into the Peloponnesus during the 14th and 13th centuries, mingled their blood with the Pelasgo Mycenaeans there, and towards 1250 BC became the ruling class. Probably it was they who gave Greek to the Pelasgians instead of receiving it from them. In such place names as Corinth and Tyrans, Parnassus and Olympia, we may have echoes of a creto pelasgo mycenaean tongue. In the same manner, presumably, the Achaeans superimposed their mountain and sky gods upon the thonic or subterranean deities of the earlier population. For the rest, there is no sharp line of separation between the Mycenaean culture and that later phase of it, the Achaean, which we find in Homer. The two ways of life seem to have mingled and melted into one. Slowly, as the amalgamation proceeded, Aegean civilization passed away, dying in the defeat of Troy, and Greek civilization began. 2. The Heroic Legends The legends of the Heroic Age suggest both the origins and the destinies of the Achaeans. We must not ignore these stories, for though a sanguinary fancy enlivens them, they may contain more history than we suppose, and they are so bound up with the Greek poetry, drama, and art that we should be at a loss to understand these without them. The Cambridge Ancient History states, Perseus, Heracles, Minos, Theseus, Jason, it has been common in modern times to regard these and the other heroes of this age as purely mythical creations. The later Greeks, in criticizing the records of their past, had no doubt that they were historical persons who actually ruled in Argos and other kingdoms. And after a period of extreme skepticism, many modern critics have begun to revert to the Greek view as that which explains the evidence most satisfactorily. The heroes of the tales, like the geographical scenes in which they moved, are real. We shall assume that the major legends are true in essence, imaginative in detail. Hittite inscriptions mention an Atarisius as king of the Ahiavas in the 13th century BC. He is probably Atreus, king of the Achaeans. In Greek story, Zeus begat Tantalus, king of Phrygia, who begat Pelops, who begat Atreus, who begat Agamemnon. Pelops, being exiled, came to Elis in the western Peloponnesus about 1283 and determined to marry Hippodamia, daughter of Enomaeus, Elis's king. The east pediment of the great temple of Zeus at Olympia still tells us the story of their courtship. The king made a practice to test his daughter's suitors by competing with them in a chariot race. If the suitor won, he would receive Hippodamia. If he lost, he was put to death. Several suitors had tried and had lost both race and life. To reduce the risks, Pelops bribed the king's charioteer, Myrtilus, to remove the linchpins from the royal chariot and promised to share the kingdom with him if their plan succeeded. In the contest that ensued, the king's chariot broke down and he was killed. Pelops married Hippodamia and ruled Elis, but instead of sharing the kingdom with Myrtilus, he threw Myrtilus into the sea. As Myrtilus sank, he laid an ominous curse upon Pelops and all his descendants. 
Pelops's daughter married Stenelus, son of Perseus and king of Argos. The throne passed down to their son, Eurystheus, and after the latter's death to his uncle, Atreus. Atreus's sons, Agamemnon and Menelaus, married Clytemnestra and Helen, daughters of King Tyndareus of Lacedaemon. And when Atreus and Tyndareus died, Agamemnon and Menelaus between them ruled all the eastern Peloponnesus from their respective capitals at Mycenae and Sparta. The Peloponnesus, or island of Pelops, came to be called after their grandfather, whose descendants had quite forgotten the curse of Myrtilus. Meanwhile, the remainder of Greece was also busy with heroes, usually founding cities. In the 15th century before our era, said Greek tradition, the iniquity of the human race provoked Zeus to overwhelm it with a flood, from which one man, Deucalion, and his wife Pyrrha alone were saved in an ark or chest that came to rest on Mount Parnassus. From Deucalion's son Helen, H-E-L-L-E-N, had come all the Greek tribes and their united name, Hellenes. Helen was grandfather of Achaeus and Ion, who begot the Achaean and Ionian tribes, which, after many wanderings, peopled respectively the Peloponnesus and Attica. One of Ion's descendants, Cecrops, with the help of the goddess Athena, founded, on a site whose Acropolis had already been settled by Pelasgians, the city that was named after her, Athens. It was he, said the story, that gave civilization to Attica, instituted marriage, abolished bloody sacrifices, and taught his subjects to worship the Olympian gods, Zeus and Athena above the rest. The descendants of Cecrops ruled Athens as kings. The fourth in line was Erechtheus, to whom the city, honoring him as a god, would later dedicate one of its loveliest temples. His grandson, Theseus, about 1250, merged the twelve deems or villages of Attica into one political unity, whose citizens, wherever they lived, were to be called Athenians. Perhaps it was because of this historic Sinoikismos, or municipal cohabitation, that Athens, like Thebes and Mycenae, had a plural name. It was Theseus who brought order and power to Athens, ended the sacrifice of her children to Minos, and gave her people security on the roads by slaying the highwayman Procrustes, who had liked to stretch or cut the legs of his captives to make them fit his bed. After Theseus's death, Athens worshipped him too as a god. As late as 476, in the skeptical age of Pericles, the city brought the bones of Theseus from Skiros and deposited them as sacred relics in the temple of Theseus. To the north, in Boeotia, a rival capital had equally stirring traditions destined to become the very substance of Greek drama in the Classic Age. Late in the 14th century BC, the Phoenician or Cretan or Egyptian prince Cadmus founded the city of Thebes at the meeting of the roads that cross Greece from east to west and from north to south, taught its people letters, and slew the dragon, perhaps an ancient phrase for an infecting or infesting organism, that hindered the settlers from using the waters of the Orion Spring. From the dragon's teeth, which Cadmus sowed in the earth, sprang armed men who, like the Greeks of history, attacked one another until only five survived. These five, said Thebes, were the founders of her royal families. The government established itself on a hill citadel called the Cadmia, where in our own time a palace of Cadmus has been unearthed. There, after Cadmus, reigned his son Polydorus, his grandson Labdicus, and his great-grandson Laius, whose son Oedipus, as all the world knows, slew his father and married his mother. When Oedipus died, his sons quarreled over the scepter, as is the habit of princes. Eteocles drove out Polynices, who persuaded Adrastus, king of Argos, to attempt his restoration. Adrastus tried, in circa 1213, in the famous War of the Seven against Thebes, and again sixteen years later in the War of the Epigoni, or Sons of the Seven. This time both Ateocles and Polynices were killed, and Thebes was burned to the ground. Among the Theban aristocrats was one Amphitryon, who had a charming wife, Alcmene. Her, Zeus visited while Amphitryon was gone to the wars, and Heracles, or Hercules, was their son. Hera, who did not relish these jovial condescensions, sent two serpents to destroy the babe in the cradle, but the boy grasped one in each hand and strangled them both. Therefore he was called Heracles, as having won glory through Hera. Linus, oldest name in the history of music, tried to teach the youth how to play and sing, but Heracles did not care for music and slew Linus with the lyre. When he grew up, a clumsy, bibulous, gluttonous, kindly giant, he undertook to kill a lion that was ravaging the flocks of Amphitryon and Thespius. The latter, king of Thespii, offered his home and his fifty daughters to Heracles, who rose to the occasion manfully. 
he slew the lion and wore its skin as his garb. He married Megara, daughter of Creon of Thebes, and tried to settle down. But Hera sent a madness upon him, and unwittingly he killed his own children. He consulted the oracle at Delphi, and was instructed to go and live at Tyrans and serve Eurystheus, the Argive king, for twelve years, after which he would become an immortal god. He obeyed and carried out for Eurystheus his famous twelve labors. Released by the king, Heracles returned to Thebes. He performed many other exploits. He joined the Argonauts, sacked Troy, helped the gods to win their battle against the giants, freed Prometheus, brought Alcestis back to life, and now and then killed his own friends by accident. After his death he was worshipped as hero and god, and since he had had countless loves, many tribes claimed him as their progenitor. His sons made their home at Trachis in Thessaly, but Eurystheus, fearing lest they depose him in revenge for the unnecessary labors that he had laid upon their father, ordered the Trachinian king to exile them from Greece. The Heraclidae, that is, children of Heracles, found refuge in Athens. Eurystheus sent an army to attack them, but they defeated and killed him. When Atreus came against them with another force, Hylas, one of the sons, offered to fight any of Atreus's men in single combat, on condition that if he won, the Heraclidae should receive the kingdom of Mycenae. If he lost, the Heraclidae would depart and not return for fifty years, after which time their children were to receive Mycenae. He lost and led his partisans into exile. Fifty years later a new generation of Heraclidae returned. It was they, not the Dorians, said Greek tradition, who, being resisted in their claims, conquered the Peloponnesus and put an end to the heroic age. If the tale of Pelops and his descendants suggests the Asia Minor origin of the Achaeans, the theme of their destiny is struck in the story of the Argonauts. Like so many of the legends that served as both the historical tradition and the popular fiction of the Greeks, it is an excellent narrative with all the elements of adventure, exploration, war, love, mystery, and death woven into a fabric so rich that after the dramatists of Athens had almost worn it bare, it was rewoven into a very passable epic in Hellenistic days by Apollonius of Rhodes. It begins in Boeotian or Kamenos, on the harsh note of human sacrifice, like Agamemnon's tragedy. Finding his land stricken with famine, King Athamas proposed to offer his son Phrixus to the gods. Phrixus learned of the plan and escaped from Orchomenos with his sister Hella, riding with her through the air on a ram with a golden fleece. But the ram was unsteady, and Hella fell off and was drowned in the strait, which, after her, was called the Hellespont. Phrixus reached land and found his way to Caucasus, at the farther end of the Black Sea. There he sacrificed the ram and hung up its fleece as an offering to Ares, god of war. Aetes, king of Caucasus, set a sleepless dragon to watch the fleece, for an oracle had said that he should die if a stranger carried it off. And to better assure himself, he decreed that all strangers coming to Caucasus should be put to death. His daughter Medea, who loved strange men and ways, pitied the wayfarers who entered Caucasus and helped them to escape. Her father ordered her to be confined, but she fled to a sacred precinct near the sea and lived there in bitter brooding till Jason found her wandering on the shore. Some twenty years before, Greek chronologists said about 1245, Peleus, son of Poseidon, had usurped the throne of Aeson, king of Iolcus in Thessaly. Aeson's infant son Jason had been hidden by friends and had grown up in the woods to great strength and courage. One day he appeared in the marketplace, dressed in a leopard skin and armed with two spears, and demanded his kingdom. But he was simple as well as strong, and Peleus persuaded him to undertake a heavy task as the price of the throne, to recover the golden fleece. So Jason built the great ship Argo, the swift, and called to the adventure the bravest spirits in Greece. Heracles came with his beloved companion Hylas, and Peleus, father of Achilles, Theseus, Meleager, Orpheus, and the fleet-footed maiden Atalanta. As the vessel entered the Hellespont, it was halted, seemingly by some force from Troy, for Heracles left the expedition to sack the city and kill its king Laomedon and all his sons but Priam. When, after many tribulations, the Argonauts reached their goal, they were warned by Medea of the death that awaited all strangers in Colchis. But Jason persisted, and Medea agreed to help him gain the fleece if he would take her to Thessaly and keep her as his wife until he died. He pledged himself to her, captured the fleece with her aid, and fled back to his ship with her and his men. Many of them were wounded, but Medea quickly healed them with roots and herbs. When Jason reached Iolcus, he again asked for the kingdom, and Peleus again delayed. Then Medea, by the arts of a sorceress, deceived the daughters of Peleus into boiling him to death. Frightened by her magic powers, the people drove her and Jason from Iolcus 
and debarred him forever from the throne. The rest belongs to Euripides. A myth is often a bit of popular wisdom personified in poetic figures, as the story of Eden suggests the disillusionment of knowledge and the liabilities of love. Legend is often a fragment of history swelling with new fictions as it rolls down the years. It is probable that in the generation before the historic siege of Troy, the Greeks had tried to force their way through the Hellespont and open the Black Sea to colonization and trade. The story of the Argonauts may be the dramatized memory of that commercial exploration, and the Golden Fleece may refer to the woolen skins or cloths anciently used in northern Asia Minor to catch particles of gold carried down by the streams. A Greek settlement was actually made about this time on the island of Lemnos, not far from the Hellespont. The Black Sea proved inhospitable despite its propitiating name, and the fortress of Troy rose again after Heracles' visitation to discourage adventures in the strait. But the Greeks did not forget. They would come again, a thousand ships instead of one, and on the plain of Ilion, the Achaeans would destroy themselves to free the Hellespont. 3. Homeric Civilization How shall we reconstruct the life of Achaean Greece, 1300 to 1100 B.C., out of the poetry of its legends? Our chief reliance must be upon Homer, who may never have existed, and whose epics are younger by at least three centuries than the Achaean age. It is true that archaeology has surprised the archaeologists by making realities of Troy, Mycenae, Tyrans, Knossos, and other cities described in the Iliad, and by exhuming a Mycenaean civilization strangely akin to that which spontaneously takes form between the lines of Homer so that our inclination today is to accept as real the central characters of his fascinating tales. Nonetheless, it is impossible to say how far the poems reflect the age in which the poet lived, rather than the age of which he writes. We shall merely ask, then, what did Greek tradition, as gathered together in Homer, conceive the Homeric age to be? In any case, we shall have a picture of Hellas in buoyant transit, from the Aegean culture to the civilization of historic Greece. 1. Labor the Achaeans, that is, the Greeks of the heroic age, impress us as less civilized than the Mycenaeans who preceded them, and more civilized than the Dorians who followed them. They are above all physical, the men tall and powerful, the women ravishingly lovely, in an unusually literal sense. Like the Romans a thousand years after them, the Achaeans looked down upon literary culture as effeminate degeneration. They use writing under protest, and the only literature they know is the martial lay and unwritten song of the troubadour. If we believe Homer, we must suppose that Zeus had realized in Achaean society the aspiration of the American poet who wrote that if he were God, he would make all men strong and all women beautiful, and would then himself become a man. Homeric Greece is Kalagynica. It is a dream of fair women. The men, too, are handsome, with their long hair and their brave beards. The greatest gift that a man can give is to cut off his hair and lay it as an offering upon the funeral pyre of his friend. Nakedness is not yet cultivated. Both sexes cover the body with a quadrangular garment folded over the shoulders, tied with a clasp pin, and reaching nearly to the knees. The women may add a veil or a girdle, and the men a loincloth, which, as dignity increases, will evolve into drawers and trousers. The well-to-do go in for costly robes, such as that which Priam brings humbly to Achilles in ransom for his son. The men are bare-legged, the women bare-armed. Both wear shoes or sandals outdoors, but are usually barefoot within. Both sexes wear jewelry, and the women in Paris anoint the body with rose-scented oil. How do these men and women live? Homer shows them to us tilling the soil, sniffing with pleasure the freshly turned dark earth, running their eyes with pride along the furrows they have plowed so straight, winnowing the wheat, irrigating the fields, and banking up the streams against the winter floods. He makes us feel the despair of the peasant whose months of toil are washed out by the torrent at the full, that in swift course shatters the dikes, neither can the long line of mounds hold it in, nor the walls of the fruitful orchards stay its sudden coming. The land is hard to farm, for much of it is mountain or swamp or deeply wooded hill. The villages are visited by wild beasts, and hunting is a necessity before it becomes a sport. The rich are great stock breeders, raising cattle, sheep, pigs, goats, and horses. One Erechthonius keeps three thousand brood mares with their foals. The poor eat fish and grain, occasionally vegetables. Warriors and the rich rely upon great portions of roast meat. They breakfast on meat and wine. Odysseus and his swineherd eat, between them, a small roast pig for luncheon and a third of a five-year-old hog for dinner. They have honey instead of sugar, meat fat instead of butter. 
Instead of bread, they eat cakes of grain baked large and thin on a plate of iron or a hot stone. The diners do not recline as the Athenians will do, but sit on chairs, not at a central table, but along the walls with little tables between the seats. There are no forks, spoons, or napkins, and only such knives as the guests may carry. Eating is managed with the fingers. The staple drink, even among the poor and among children, is diluted wine. The land is owned by the family or the clan, not by the individual. The father administers and controls it, but he cannot sell it. In the Iliad, great tracts are called the king's commons or domain, temenos. In effect, it belongs to the community, and in its fields, any man may pasture his flocks. In the Odyssey, these common lands are being divided and sold to, or appropriated by, rich or strong individuals. The commons disappears in ancient Greece, precisely as in modern England. The soil might yield metal as well as food, but the Achaeans neglect to mine the earth and are content to import copper and tin, silver and gold, and a strange new luxury, iron. A shapeless mass of iron is offered as a precious prize at the games held in honor of Patroclus. It will make, says Achilles, many an agricultural implement. He says nothing of weapons, which are still of bronze. The Odyssey describes the tempering of iron, but that epic probably belongs to a later age than the Iliad. The smith at his forge and the potter at his wheel work in their shops. Other Homeric craftsmen, saddlers, masons, carpenters, cabinet makers, go to work at the home that has ordered their product. They do not produce for a market, for sale or profit. They work long hours, but leisurely, without the sting and stimulus of visible competition. The family itself provides most of its needs. Everyone in it labors with his hands. Even the master of the house, even the local king, like Odysseus, makes bed and chairs for his home, boots and saddles for himself. And unlike the later Greeks, he prides himself on his manual skill. Penelope, Helen, and Andromache, as well as their servant women, are busy with spinning, weaving, embroidery, and household cares. Helen seems lovelier when she displays her needlework to Telemachus than when she walks in beauty on the battlements of Troy. The craftsmen are freemen, never slaves, as in classic Greece. Peasants may, in emergency, be conscripted to labor for the king, but we do not hear of serfs bound to the soil. Slaves are not numerous, nor is their position degraded. They are mostly female domestics and occupy a position in effect as high as that of household servants today, except that they are bought and sold for long terms instead of for precariously brief engagements. On occasion, they are brutally treated. Normally, they are accepted as members of the family, are cared for in illness or depression or old age, and may develop a humane relation of affection with master or mistress. Nausicaa helps her bondwomen to wash the family linen in the stream, plays ball with them, and altogether treats them as companions. If a slave woman bears a son to her master, the child is usually free. Any man, however, may become a slave, through capture in battle or in piratical raids. This is the bitterest aspect of Achaean life. Homeric society is rural and local. Even these cities are mere villages nestling against hilltop citadels. Communication is by messenger or herald, or over long distances by signal fires flashing from peak to peak. Overland traffic is made difficult and dangerous by roadless mountains and swamps and bridgeless streams. The carpenter makes carts with four wheels boasting of spokes and wooden tires. Even so, most goods are carried by mules or men. Trade by sea is easier, despite pirates and storms. Natural harbors are numerous, and only on the perilous four-day trip from Crete to Egypt does the ship lose sight of land. Usually the boat is beached at night, and crew and passengers sleep on trusty land. In this age, the Phoenicians are still better merchants and mariners than the Greeks. The Greeks revenge themselves by despising trade and preferring piracy. The Homeric Greeks have no money, but use as media for exchange ingots of iron, bronze, or gold. The ox or cow is taken as a standard of value. A gold ingot of 57 pounds is called a talent, talenton, or weight. Much barter remains. Wealth is computed realistically in goods, especially cattle, rather than in pieces of metal or paper that may lose or alter their value at any moment through a change in the economic theology of men. There are rich and poor in Homer as in life. Society is a rumbling cart that travels an uneven road. And no matter how carefully the cart is constituted, some of the varied objects in it will sink to the bottom and others will rise to the top. The potter has not made all the vessels of the same earth or strength or fragility. Already in the second book of the Iliad, we hear the sound of the class war, and as Thersites flies oratorically at Agamemnon, we recognize an early variation on a persistent theme. 2. Morals As we read Homer, the impression forms that we are in the presence of a society more lawless and primitive than that of Gnosis or Mycenae. 
The Achaean culture is a step backward, a transition between the brilliant Aegean civilization and the Dark Age that will follow the Dorian conquest. Homeric life is poor in art, rich in action. It is unmeditative, buoyant, swift. It is too young and strong to bother much about manners or philosophy. Probably we misjudge it by seeing it in the violent crisis or disorderly aftermath of war. There are, it is true, many tender qualities and scenes. Even the warriors are generous and affectionate. Between parent and child there is a love as profound as it is silent. Odysseus kisses the heads and shoulders of the members of his family when, after their long separation, they recognize him, and in like manner they kiss him. Helen and Menelaus weep when they learn that this noble lad, Telemachus, is the son of the lost Odysseus who fought so valiantly for them. Agamemnon himself is capable of tears so abundant that they remind Homer of a stream pouring over rocks. Friendships are firm among the heroes, though possibly a degree of sexual inversion enters into the almost neurotic attachment of Achilles to Patroclus, especially to Patroclus dead. Hospitality is lavish, for from Zeus are all strangers and beggars. Maids bathe the foot or the body of the guest, anoint him with unguents, and may give him fresh garments. He receives food and lodging if he needs them, and perhaps a gift. Lo, says fair-cheeked Helen, as she places a costly robe in Telemachus's hands, I too give thee this gift, dear child, a remembrance of the hands of Helen, against the day of thy longed-for marriage for thy bride to wear. It is a picture that reveals to us the human tenderness and fine feeling that in the Iliad must hide themselves under the panoply of war. Even war does not thwart the Greek passion for games. Children and adults engage in skillful and difficult contests, apparently with fairness and good humor. Penelope's suitors play drafts and throw the disc or javelin. The Phaeacian hosts of Odysseus play at quoits, and a strange medley of ball and dance. When the dead Patroclus has been cremated, according to Achaean custom, games are played that set a precedent for Olympia. Foot races, disc throwing, javelin throwing, archery, wrestling, chariot races, and single combat fully armed. All in excellent spirit, except that only the ruling class may enter, and only the gods may cheat. The other side of the picture is less pleasing. As a prize for the chariot race, Achilles offers a woman skilled in fair handiwork, and on the funeral pyre horses, dogs, oxen, sheep, and human beings are sacrificed to keep the dead Patroclus well tended and fed. Achilles treats Priam with fine courtesy, but only after dragging Hector's body in mangled ignominy around the pyre. To the Achaean male, human life is cheap. To take it is no serious matter. A moment's pleasure can replace it. When a town is captured, the men are killed or sold into slavery. The women are taken as concubines if they are attractive, as slaves if they are not. Piracy is still a respected occupation. Even kings organize marauding expeditions, plunder towns and villages, and enslave their population. Indeed, says Thucydides, this came to be the main source of livelihood among the early Hellenes, no disgrace being yet attached to such an occupation. But some glory, very much as in our times great nations may conquer and subjugate defenseless peoples without loss of dignity or righteousness. Odysseus is insulted when he is asked, is he a merchant, mindful of the gains of his greed? But he tells with pride how, on his return from Troy, his provisions having run low, he sacked the city of Ismarus and stored his ships with food, or how he ascended the river Egyptus to pillage the splendid fields, to carry off the women and little children, and to kill the men. No city is safe from sudden and unprovoked attack. To this light-hearted relish for robbery and slaughter, the Achaeans add an unabashed mendacity. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now.